Revelation chapter 11. We are in uh, chapter 11, picking things up in verse 15 and starting in chapter 10 of Revelation. We have what is known as a parenthetical passage. And as we mentioned last week, there is a sequence to the book of of Revelation. There are the uh, seven seals, which then uh, proceed and give way to the seven trumpet judgments, and then the seven trumpet judgments give way to the seven bowl judgments. And there's a sequence in all of that. Between each of these collections of seven, the Lord in the book of Revelation takes several chapters then to uh, speak to us about some of the things that are going on that would kind of interrupt the sequence if he inserted all of them. So they're called parentheses, they're called parenthetical passages, and he's just giving us some insight into other things that are happening in the world while all of these other things are unfolding. And we saw last week in chapter 11 as we uh, closed out what we were studying the two witnesses that were faithful unto the Lord there in in Jerusalem and how upon their death the whole world celebrated giving presents to one another and it was like kind of a Christmas time it'll be on the world over the death of these two righteous men it's interesting it's the only place in the book of Revelation that we see rejoicing in celebration during the period of the tribulation and and that is when the world rejoices over the death of these two righteous and holy men but man never has the final say in the life of a child of God they were resurrected ascended up into heaven and then God declared that uh, a greater woe uh, than the earthquake in Jerusalem and all that occurred following that and a greater woe was coming upon the earth Uh, chapter 15 and then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his is Christ and he shall reign forever and ever so as as this thing is moving closer and closer to the end of the tribulation period now there is this uh, cry in heaven uh, rejoicing really that is building over the fact that this earth is going to come under new management that uh, it is no longer going to be ruled by sinful man no longer be dominated by sin the rebellion of man against God is going to be brought to an end that Jesus is going to then establish a kingdom uh, that has uh, that he will reign forever and ever in other words it will never be again what it has been uh, since the fall in in Genesis chapter 3 until this time in the great tribulation the world is going to uh, be ruled by him and uh, it will be marked by righteousness it will be marked uh, by peace and the 24 elders who stand before God on their thrones uh, at this other declaration they fell on their faces and they worshiped uh, God and this is what they worshiped saying Uh, to the Lord and it's interesting what they do say to the Lord here in this song or whether they just you know speak it out we don't really know it's kind of an encapsulation of the rest of the book we give you thanks O Lord God Almighty the fact that that this world is not going to go on as it uh, has gone on and uh, uh, and it being marked by sin uh, you know dominated by sin what sin has produced in in the human condition it that's a cause for praise uh, in heaven and in our hearts too and so they begin to worship we give you thanks O Lord God Almighty you know praising him for his almightiness praising him for his power because he's the only one that can stop the insanity of what this world is apart from God and how crazy it is getting even more and more by the day uh, as it moves away from him the one who is and who was and is and who is to come speaking of the fact that he is eternal 
Because you have taken your great power and reign, the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And so speaking of the rebellion of man against God, even in the great tribulation, uh, but God's wrath coming against their, their unrighteous anger, his righteous wrath, there's no doubt about who's going to win in this uh, battle, man's sinful anger, anger at God, God's righteous righteous wrath at man's sin and uh, following all of that there will be the judgment uh, the time of the dead that they shall be judged and that you should reward your servants and the prophets and the saints and at the end of the age there is a, a rewarding of those that have been faithful to the Lord and those who fear your name small and great and then should destroy those who destroy the earth. That's a picture of, of the remaining chapters, really, of Revelation. And then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Now remember from the book of Hebrews that the, when God gave uh, Moses the model for the tabernacle and then what became the model for the temple when Solomon built it David's son that that tabernacle that tent the place it was a meeting uh, 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 tent of meeting it was a place to meet with God where God chose that this will characterize my presence this is where you'll meet with me uh, prior to the coming of Messiah that that tabernacle and that uh, temple they were they were given as models of the reality that's in heaven and and so here John sees this the temple of God is opened up in heaven and uh, and what and then the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple now the ark of the covenant was in the holy of holies of the temple so the holy of holies is opened up in the temple in heaven now one of the interesting things about this Ark of the Covenant that he speaks about here is the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And, uh, and it also contained the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of the law that were given to Moses. They were put in the Ark of the Covenant. So those were the two things about the Ark of the Covenant. Represented the presence of God, represented his holiness, represented his justice, represented his law, the law being in there. And I wouldn't be surprised if God wrote those two tablets of stone, gave them to Moses, and they are reflective of law that is written in that heavenly uh, you know, Ark of the Covenant and that heavenly scene. And what's, what God is saying here and what John is witnessing is, is that God is going to take now His law, the righteous standard of His law, the perfect holiness of His law. That's what all of this represents. And He is going to bring that law to bear upon the earth. And any time you have God's holy, righteous law coming into contact with sin and rebellion against him, it must of necessity turn into judgment. And that's what's coming. And that's why you see the, uh, the lightnings and the noises and the earthquake and the thundering and the great hail. As this temple is opened up, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant is seen. It's an indication that a terrible, terrible storm is now going to come to the earth. Isn't it aggravating to watch the... Um, ACLU worked so hard to remove the Ten Commandments from every kind of public place. And they move them out of the courtyards and they move them out of the court, not the courtyards, but out of the courtrooms and, and all of these different. They're going to get rid of the Ten Commandments as being in front of people, that righteous, you know, law that, that God has given in the Bible. And, and uh, we don't want to be confronted by that when it speaks about worshiping Him and worshiping Him only and not stealing and not lying and, and, and all of these kinds of things. We don't want it. We'll determine right and wrong. We don't want God's laws superimposed upon us. And the idea, man is so... Uh, I'm trying to get better. He's so brutish. That's the King James word for it. But as if to think that somehow by removing this, I don't like it removed. Don't get me wrong. I'm not under the law. Don't get me wrong. But the law has a purpose and a work that it does in people's lives until they come to know the Lord. And then when the Holy Spirit comes into them, an even higher law comes inside of us. But it convicts us of sin. 
it speaks to us of the fact that we are sinners. We cannot live up to even ten commandments of God, of his, his righteous standard. But the idea that we're going to remove the ten commandments from the public, uh, you know, uh, settings of the United States of America and be out from under the law is crazy. You will not escape the law. God just opens up the Holy of Holies in heaven, and He's going to bring the law of Moses, whether we're willing to have it on our courtrooms or not. He's going to bring it to bear on the earth. And that's what's going to happen. And it's not going to be pretty because of the rebellion of man against the Ten Commandments and against God's righteousness and His law. <sighs> Chapter 12, he consider, con, continues, continues down the same parenthetical vein related to uh, speaking to us about other things. And now in chapters 12 and 13, he introduces us to seven very uh, significant personages that are very active uh, in, in the period of the tribulation and uh, personages that we need to know something about to make uh, rhyme or reason of this book. And he begins in verse 1, Now I saw a, gr a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So here's this great sign. that appears in heaven. John sees this woman with that description. Uh, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, her head uh, uh, on her head, a garland of 12 stars with child, ready to give birth. She's in the middle of labor and all of that. And the question becomes, who in the world is this woman? Some people look at it and they say, well, it's, it's the church. But the problem with that is that it can't represent the church because she's with child. And uh, the church is represented in the scriptures as being a chaste virgin uh, unto the Lord. And this woman is clearly not a virgin, uh, being ready to give delivery to this child. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul said, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you, speaking of the church, to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his, his wife, that is the church, has made herself ready. So it can't be the church. The, the, as we'll see a little bit later in verse 5, she gives birth to a male child uh, who can be none other than, than the Lord Jesus himself, the Messiah. And, and so you can't have the church giving birth to Jesus uh, because Jesus has given uh, spiritual birth to the church. He has begotten us again into a relationship with the Lord. So others look at it and they say, well, that probably speaks of Mary, the mother uh, of Jesus because she's with child and uh, and the child is clearly Jesus and so it represents her the problem with that is we're going to see in verse 6 as the woman flees into the wilderness and all to a place that's been prepared for her and then a little bit later in verses 13 through 17 that describe her her flight also there that none of that description is consistent with uh, Mary the mother of, of Jesus what she represents and who she represents is the nation of Israel. The imagery as we continue to look to the Old Testament to be the means by which we interpret the book of Revelation to stay on safe ground, we can look at that and say, well, where in the world is this kind of imagery that talks about the sun, the moon, and, and the twelve stars? And uh, we know that that imagery is used in Genesis chapter 37. And uh, it's used in chapter 37 to speak of Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, to speak of his wife, Rachel, and then also of his 12 sons. You remember Joseph, he came to his brothers, and Joseph's a pretty special kid, but uh, when you're one of, of, uh, of 12 boys, uh, sometimes you need to keep that to yourself. 
So he knew God had some pretty good plans for him and uh, gave him some revelation related to that. And he came up to his brothers and he said, you know, we were all out. I had a vision. We were all out binding up sheaves of wheat out in the field and everything. And, and we all threw our sheaves down of wheat in a pile. Very common imagery of the day. And he said, my sheaf jumped up and all of your sheaves bowed down to mine. <laughs> Best to keep that between you and the Lord. Not everything God shows us has to be, uh, you know, shared uh, on the thing. And so they, they immediately knew what he was saying. Are we going to bow down to you, you know? And he had another vision, and he spoke it to his father and his mother and, and another dream. And he said, look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars, they all bowed down to me. And he told it to his, his father and his brothers. And his father rebukes him. And said to him, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? So it represents the nation of, uh, of Israel as we look to the Old Testament to make things clear uh, for us. And then the second personage is, is described there in verse 3. Uh, none other than the devil himself. And, I, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his uh, heads and so here is the dragon now if you if you just look up look down with me or wherever it is in your bible uh, all around do the hope anyway in verse 9 it says so the great dragon was cast out so talking about the dragon that serpent of old called the devil and satan so the text itself clearly identifies uh, this dragon here as uh, as being uh, the devil notice that he is fiery red perhaps it speaks about his appetite for blood he is a murderer as jesus said has been from uh, the beginning you notice that it's spoken of having ten horns i don't know if this is where kind of the imagery historically of him being dressed in red and, and having horns comes from. I don't know where the pitchfork and all that, that might come from, but maybe it comes from this imagery here. You notice that he has ten uh, horns, and biblically horns uh, speak of power uh, symbolically uh, in, in the Old Testament. And from Daniel chapter 7, and for those of you who are taking notes, specifically verses 7 and 8, and then again verse 24, we learn that the ten horns speak of ten kings who will make up a final world ruling empire at the end of the age prior to the establishment of Jesus' kingdom uh, on the earth at his second coming. A final world ruling empire that looks very much like what is happening uh, in Europe today. It will come out of the old Roman empire. And these ten kings will turn their power over to the devil, uh, not personally, but in the form of the Antichrist. Uh, and he will use that power then to dominate and, and to rule the world during the Great Tribulation. The seven heads, uh, heads are oftentimes a symbol of wisdom. Uh, in the scriptures, seven is a number of completeness. I wouldn't be dogmatic on this, but perhaps it, it speaks about, uh, you know, the completeness of wisdom that the, that the devil has in a, in a sense that uh, through the Antichrist that the devil will deceive the world with a supernatural uh, demonic uh, wisdom. You remember in Satan's fall in Genesis chapter 3 that we're told that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He's very wise. He's very, very uh, subtle. He knows how to uh, package a lie and sell people on on a lie, and he's going to give that ability uh, to the Antichrist. It speaks of him having seven crowns, and crowns speak of authority. They speak of, of power. And because of the removal of the church, the influence of the Holy Spirit in the world through uh, Christians at the time of the rapture, he is going to very easily consolidate the power of the world around him, and uh, he is going to take all of the power, all of the authority in the world during the Great Tribulation and, and use it for his purposes, but he'll do that again through his instrument, uh, the Antichrist. We're told a little bit more about him in uh, verse 4. He, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. 
Now, this seems to refer to Satan's uh, original rebellion against God. He's the one, as far as we know, he's the one that tempted, Ad, uh, tempted Eve and, uh, and all. But he was, already, he was already a sinful creature by the time that that happens. It is through the devil that sin was introduced into the universe. Sin was introduced into the human condition. Through, through Adam and Eve, but he fell uh, prior to that. So he rebelled against God because of his pride, because of his selfish ambition. He fell from his first estate as a very, very high-ranking uh, uh, angel. We're told in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And so it goes on then in that passage, one of the key passages in the Old Testament about uh, the fall of, of, of the devil. But he has fallen, and from this passage, it would appear that a third of the angelic host followed him in his rebellion. That one third of existing angels followed the devil in his uh, proud rebellion against God and against God's authority. And they are uh, what we know as demons today. Now you think about the devil's ability to deceive. These created beings minister in the very presence of God. We sing about that throne. We sing about the throne that we're one day going to stand before and worship the God who inhabits that throne. We do it by faith. These angelic beings were there, seeing God in all of His glory, in all of His wisdom, in all of His power, in all, in all, in all, in all. And the devil convinces a third of them to follow him in his rebellion. Now, how seductive is that? How subtle is that? Don't move from your Bibles. The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. If you, to try and take on the devil and say, well, you know, I'll just go head to head intellectually with him and all of that. He is greater in terms of pure creation than any of us in this room. Not greater than what we are in Christ. But you never want to take him on in his subtlety. Apart from the Bible and from the Word of God. Why did Jesus, each time he was in that temptation at the beginning of his public ministry, and the devil came against him and tempted him three times in three different ways, each time Jesus responded in the same way, by answering with the Word of God. That's the safe way to answer the Word of God, to know the Word of God, and then answer his temptation or his lies with it. Now, very important to understand. That if a third of the angels followed the devil in his rebellion, two-thirds didn't. Isn't it funny how, you know, you can read things about young people or about this or that, anything in the world, you know, and a certain number of, of this is bad and all. And then you think, yeah, we think everybody's bad. The whole group, you know, the kitten caboodle and, uh, of, of them and all. Because a, a minority can get us thinking uh, about everyone in, in that way. But remember, two-thirds stayed faithful to God. Two-thirds stayed faithful to God. And that was bad, that's bad news for the devil, as we're going to see in just uh, a few moments. Twice as many faithful. And then the devil, uh, notice what the dragon did. He stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour, and this, and this child is the Christ, speaking of Jesus' birth. And so the dragon stood before the woman. Here she is. I mean, if you've ever, here's a woman giving birth, and the dragon's right there ready to, the devil to, to destroy the baby as, as the baby is born. And so the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And all of that was fulfilled through that uh, demonic madman Herod remember when Jesus was was born and the wise men then came and they wanted to uh, worship 
this one that was born, they'd seen the star in the heavens and they were bringing gifts to him and all of this. And Herod said, well, what do you mean another king in Israel? Well, he, he was the king in Israel and all. And he said, well, you go ahead and do that and bring word back to me just where this king is, you know. And he sharpened his knife because he's going to go back and he's going he's to kill the Messiah, kill Jesus And an angel of the Lord comes to Joseph following the departure of the wise men. The wise men are told, go back another way. Don't go back the way that you did. And and an angel of the Lord speaks to Joseph and says, Herod's going to seek the the death of this child. And so you go down into Egypt, which which is what he did with Jesus then and Mary for a time. But that, that's what Herod did. And then Herod sent uh, military into Bethlehem, killed every boy two years of age and younger in an attempt to wipe out. And, and who, who's behind it? The devil behind it. Satan, I, I, I'm convinced, Satan is he's not, a, uh, he's not a careful student of the Bible. But um, he knows something about the Bible. And uh, he was there on that scene in Genesis chapter 3, you remember, when God was speaking to Adam and Eve about the curse that sin was going to bring upon them and and upon both male and upon female. And then he also spoke to to Satan in, in that same garden and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Speaking of the coming Messiah that would crush the authority of of the devil. And I think that Satan recognized that that this one, this Messiah, is the one that's promised to crush his authority. And so he tries to destroy uh, Jesus through Herod right at the outset. Verse 5. And she bore a male child who was to rule all of the nations with a rod of iron. Now that, that's a quote from Psalm 2. Again, looking to the Old Testament to help us understand. And, and talking about the coming Messiah, that he would be both a Messiah and he would also be a king. That he would establish a kingdom and that he would rule that kingdom with a rod of iron. And, and so it's messianic. It's talking about the Messiah, talking about Jesus. Then as if, if there's any doubt at all, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, at Jesus' second coming, these characteristics of ruling the nations with a rod of iron, they're ascribed specifically to him where we're told, Now out of his mouth, Jesus at his second coming comes a sharp sword that with it, He should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So it's speaking about the birth of Messiah and her child, the child that Israel, God chose Israel to bring into the world, was caught up to God and his throne. Speaking of the fact that Jesus of Jesus' resurrection and then his ascension uh, into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, where he sits uh, tonight interceding uh, for us. Then the woman, uh, we're told, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,000 260 days. And so this woman, Israel, she flees into the wilderness, and it's speaking of the Judean wilderness to the east of Jerusalem, out toward the Dead Sea. And, uh, and toward the country of Jordan. Uh, very often when someone goes on the trip to Israel, uh, they're anticipating that all of Israel is a desert. And uh, not going to see a tree anywhere. It'll be all cactus and gila monsters and uh, stuff like that. And, uh, and then surprised to see this very much like California. It has a desert down in the south. It has a central valley. It has a river that runs right through, uh, you know, through it and, and separating that valley. It's called the Jordan Valley. There are forests to the north and, uh, and uh, sitting on the coast and all of this. But it does have a desert and it does have a wilderness out to the east of Jerusalem toward the Dead Sea. And, and so uh, she is going to head out in that Uh, direction to flee from uh, the persecution, as we're going to see in a moment, of this dragon uh, of of the devil. Now, apparently, 
as the Israel, and I think this happens at the three and a half year mark of the tribulation period, where when the Antichrist goes into the, into the Holy of Holies and he declares himself to be God and he demands that people worship him as God. A light's going to go on for the Jews. They're going to realize this guy's crazy. We're not going to worship him. And, uh, and, and they realize that they've been deceived. And then they're going to, to flee. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is that Jesus gives them this counsel for anyone who's it, here during the tribulation period and sees the abomination that causes desolation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. I'll read it. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down uh, to take anything out of his house. And he goes on and, and speak, speaks in Jewish kind of terms. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those uh, with nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So it appears, I think there's the possibility here, that when they're deceived, somehow they, because they do flee to the wilderness, they flee exactly where Jesus tells them to flee. That somehow they become aware of his counsel and perhaps at this point some of them come to faith related to him. As, as, as the Messiah, given the fact that they heed his instruction from, from the Olivet Discourse in Matthew uh, chapter uh, 24, 24. So they go, they go out into this wilderness place, and uh, it's prepared, a place that's prepared by God. He knows this is going to happen to the Jewish people, and then they are fed supernaturally there for 1,000 260 days, which refers to three and a half years. So the second three and a half years of, of the tribulation period. Now it's interesting, in Isaiah chapter 16, God prophesies through Isaiah and says, Send the lamb to the ruler of the land, from Selah to the wilderness, and to the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be as, as a wandering bird thrown out of the nest, and so shall the daughters of Moab be at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day, hide the outcast, do not betray him who escapes. And then verse 4, very important, God says to Moab, which is modern-day Jordan, which is to the east in the wilderness from Jerusalem, he said, Let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab. Be a shelter uh, to them from the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner is at hand. The devastation ceases. The oppressors have consumed out of the land. And so... God speaking even through Isaiah, it appears related to all of this. God will feed them out there for three and a half years. Not hard for God. Remember now, go back to the Old Testament. Remember when because of a lack of faith, the children of Israel, somewhere between two and three million men, women, and children on a very large camping trip. And because of a lack of faith, they did not go into the promised land. And so God said, you're going to wander through the wilderness for 40 years until the generation that you thought was going to be, you know, scared of uh, uh, till this generation has died off. And your children that you're so concerned about are adults and I'll lead them into the promised land. And for 40 years, they didn't have to get any new moccasins or any new sandals or anything like that. And he fed them every day supernaturally. So it's not unprecedented. In, in God's work in the world, and he will do it once again for a shorter period of time during the Great Tribulation. Then the fourth personage that's introduced is Michael, the archangel. And the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. 
Michael's an interesting character. Very often, uh, sometimes we'll be told that uh, Michael and Gabriel are kind of equal. They are archangels. There's some speculation that maybe Satan was an archangel at the same time that the three of them held the same high position. There isn't really a biblical base for that. We are sure about Michael. And uh, because Jude speaks uh, of him as being an, an archangel uh, in Jude verse 9. And, and he appears to be the very highest ranking of angel. One of the things that's also interesting about Michael is from Daniel chapter 12 is that uh, in the, among the angelic realm when uh, Michael is spoken about, he is spoken of concerning his very specific ministry to the nation of Israel, to the Jews. Uh, Gabriel is sometimes viewed as having a ministry to the Gentiles and this kind of thing. Michael's ministry very strongly toward, uh, toward the Jews. And, and so he's kind of considered a guardian angel to the nation of Israel. So this fight goes on. This battle uh, in heaven, a war breaks out there, and Satan and his demonic host are no uh, match at all for um, Michael, and they are cast out of uh, heaven. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Satan has access to heaven uh, tonight. Uh, it fits God's plan in, in, in some way. So despite his rebellion, despite his fall, he still has access into heaven. Remember the conversation that he had with God? It's recorded in uh, Job chapter 1. And we're told there that there was a day when the sons of God, speaking of angels, they came to present themselves in heaven before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord uh, spoke to Satan. And he said, where do you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. <laughs> so he's got this kind of back and forth thing that he's, he's, got, he's racking up a lot of mileage. But, that, but, but he spends time on the earth messing things up here and then he, he goes up into heaven. And they say, well, why in the world would he go up into heaven? He has a very, very specific kind of ministry, so to speak, a diabolical ministry that he does. He goes to heaven to accuse us concerning what it is that he sees us doing on the earth. So he's called the accuser of the brethren, which we'll get to in just a moment. And, and, uh, and the Lord spoke to, to uh, Satan and said, well, have you considered my, my servant Job down there? There's none like him on the whole earth, a blameless, a upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And, and, uh, and uh, the devil says to the Lord, and he says, does Job fear, you know, God for nothing? You've blessed him with all of these things, and you put a hedge around him, and all of these things, you take these things away from you, he'll curse you to your face. In other words, Satan had already been on the earth trying to probe for weakness in Job's life, to bring an accusation against Job to, to God. But he's unsuccessful up to this point. But he does, he has access into heaven but at this point in the tribulation period that access is cut off heaven is now uh, off limits to him and again I believe that that happens at the three and a half year mark of of the the tribulation period right at the the midpoint now notice that the um, so in in uh, verse 9 that great dragon was cast out the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world and uh, he has cast uh, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him now as a result of this his being cast out of any kind of access to heaven uh, again then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down so the casting down uh, of the devil no longer having access into heaven heaven rejoices over that and heaven rejoices over that because he's no longer going to be allowed to engage in what appears to be his supreme activity in heaven and that is to go into heaven and bring accusations to God against you and I he's called the accuser of the brethren in uh, verse 11 accuser of 
of Christians. This is what he does. He accuses the brethren. The word accuser is an interesting one. It, it means uh, kataros. Kata means against. Uh, agora means a place of public speaking. So the image is in heaven is like a courtroom where the father is the judge in, in this courtroom. And so you've got uh, the devil coming in kind of like a, a prosecuting attorney bringing charges to the judge in this tribunal uh, against us in, in that environment in, in the heavenly scene. And so John is giving us insight into what is happening in, in heaven even today, even uh, tonight. And, and so the devil goes up into heaven. He watches our lives. He goes up into heaven and he lays a case out to God against us. He doesn't, he doesn't worry about the world. He's already got them in his hip pocket. He brings accusations against the brethren, against Christians. That's who, he's, that's who he's got the act of war going on against. Now, so you've got a prosecuting attorney that is so convincing that he got a third of the angels to follow him in a rebellion. And so he takes the facts concerning our life and he goes up to, there to lay a case against us. How much of a chance <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have? You notice the frequency with which he brings the accusations. Day and night. <laughs> oh, I hate it. I wish I never sinned. I wish I was like Jesus all the time. I wish I never said anything stupid. I wish I never got upset. I, I wish I was always, you know, just right and, and perfect. And one day I will be, but I'm not. And, and I fall short and I give him ammunition for accusation and for condemnation against me. So here he has legitimate accusation. And he is as slick a prosecuting attorney as you could ever, ever find. And he's got an airtight case against us. He brings it before a judge who must judge righteously. Is there any hope for us? And there is. In verse 12. How do you overcome all of that? <laughs> and they overcame him. And those are four great words right there. They overcame him, the brethren. Three things, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their lives to the death. How has the devil overcome? you got to just huff and puff and blow. Roll up your sleeves, you know, and give them the old one, too. He's overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. The Bible says the life is in the blood. And when you read about the blood of Jesus Christ, it represents his life given for you and I for the forgiveness of our sins. We're the brethren. We're a part of this family, the family of God. And so what happens in this scene is you've got the judge and he's wonderful and he's righteous. You've got the prosecuting attorney. He's got an airtight case. But because of our faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus himself becomes our defense attorney. And when those accusations are being made against us, he enters into that same courtroom and he is able to nullify the accusations of Satan the only way that they can be nullified. And that is by his blood and our faith in his sacrifice for us for the forgiveness of of sins. First John 1 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Cleanses us from all sins. Would you just enjoy that word cleanses for a moment tonight? Satan is a defeated enemy because of our faith in Christ. His accusations against us can't get any traction in heaven because of Jesus. 
and because we are in him. The only hope that he has is if he can get us to believe that we are condemned to condemn ourselves and because he knows that God does not. But we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. And then also by the word of their testimony. Every Christian has a testimony. It's our salvation story. How we came to know the Lord. You know the amazing thing to me is, is that over and over again the Apostle Paul gave his testimony in the book of Acts. He gets put in these scenes where he's got all of the kings of everywhere and all the grand poobahs from, uh, you know, bedrock are there and, and they're in the place and everything. And, and he's got an opportunity to speak anything that he wants to speak to them. And over and over again, he gives his testimony of what he once was before he came to know Christ, how he came to know Christ and the man that he is since that time. And you'd think this man with this gigantic brain considered even by secular people to be one of the greatest minds in the history of the world, that he would, you know, X and O and tic-tac-toe and corner him with a checkmate and all intellectually concerning this and that and all. And he doesn't. He gives them his testimony about what has happened in his life to produce the change. And it's important. That people know our testimony. It is a very, very powerful story. And the devil is overcome by the word of our testimony. I love it in, in uh, uh, Acts chapter 3 where we talked about it before. Where they've got that, the lame man is sitting there at the beautiful gate. He's been lame from, hit from birth, from his mother's womb. And silver and gold have I none. And, you know, we talked about that. And Peter reaches down, but in the name of Jesus Christ, and he lifts him up, and, and his strength comes into his ankles and his feet, and he begins to dance and jump and all of these. He's never known what that sensation was like. He said, man, I'd like to have that power. Well, you better be ready to be persecuted. Because <laughs> they took Peter and, and John and hauled them in before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious leaders of the day. And they wanted an explanation for what in the world is it that you're doing out there and changing lives and all of these kinds of things and, and, and everything. And Peter stands up and he speaks for the disciples and he said, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man by what means he's been made well, if that's what you want to know, then let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. <laughs> Gave them the testimony for why this man's life changed. And it's because Jesus came into his life. I think that it also refers not only to our testimony, as, as I've been saying, the testimony to how we came to know uh, the Lord. But when it talks about the word of our testimony, it's the testimony that our life has changed as a result of coming to know the Lord. In a changed life where we don't live the way that we once lived, we don't do the same things, we don't say the same things that we once lived. When our life has changed, and it's a testimony to the fact that God is inside of us now, and, and we begin to live a righteous life that takes a lot out of the hands of the devil to accuse us with. And it's one of the ways that he is, is over, overcome. And then they did not love their lives unto death. And that means that overcoming of, uh, of the devil involves a commitment to the Lord, even if it means death. Like Abdul Rahman is we're talking about. He says, well, whatever they do to me. I'm safe. I, I'm, I'm at peace with whether they kill me or they don't kill me or whatever they do. I'm not going to deny him at all. My life is not what is most important to me, but remaining faithful in my testimony to him. And in order for a person to reach a place like that in their life, where, where they, they look at things and, and as they look at it and say, I'm making a commitment to be faithful to the Lord by His grace, even if it means death. 
That takes a lot out of the hands of the devil. And in order to make that kind of a commitment, it always happens at the sacrifice of of self. But when a person settles the issue of Jesus' lordship in their life, my life is his, he can spend it however he wants. If he wants me to live to 140, if he wants me to live to 40, if he wants me to live to 20, if he wants me to die in a mission field somewhere, if he wants me to live forever until the rapture comes in a mission field, whatever he wants... But there's not that fear of death. There's the recognition, he numbers my days. That takes a lot out of the hands of the devil. What can the devil do with this brother in Afghanistan when he will not compromise even to save his life? See, life, that's the big thing. And once I will not compromise to save my life, then, then what, you know, what do you do with a person like that? How do you derail them? It's very, very difficult to to do. And of course, facing death, that's the ultimate test of self, self preservation. And here is overcoming the devil is a love for God that is even greater than our love for ourself, even under the threat of of death. And when they all of this uh, uh, is, is made known. Uh, there's an exclamation there in verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who inhabit in them. The devil's gone. He's out. He's overcome. But then on, as much as heaven is rejoicing over all of this, and it's good news for heaven, it's bad news for the inhabitants of the earth. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you and... He's not happy, Uh, having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. He knows he's got 1,260 days before he's chained at at the end of the tribulation period, and now he just wants to destroy. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been uh, cast to the earth, he immediately turns his his initial persecution against the Jewish people. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, which we've already spoken about, where she is nourished for a time, that is one, times, that's two, so you got three and half a time, three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. And so here he begins his, he's the ultimate anti-Semite, uh, turns to persecute the Jews, and then, but God, the, the, the woman, as she flees out into the wilderness, you know, she's get, you notice that she's given two wings of a great eagle. Now, uh, that imagery also comes from the Old Testament. And uh, in Exodus chapter 19, when the children of Israel, uh, as they had fled from Egypt, and Pharaoh's army is chasing behind them to destroy them and all, and God causes the waters of the Red Sea to drown them and delivers the children of Israel and all. As the children of Israel look back on that uh, event, uh, they declare, uh, you have seen, God speaking and saying, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And so I don't think that they're uh, delivered by literal eagle, eagle's wings into that wilderness place. It appears that eagle's wings represents God's supernatural deliverance of them and protection. Because in, in, in the Exodus in, in, uh, from Egypt, there were, it wasn't literal wings. It was talked about, it represented God's supernatural deliverance. So God will supernaturally deliver them to that place of protection, but the serpent isn't through. It's, uh, we're told that he spewed out uh, water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, uh, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And so uh, as he does this, it could be a literal flood. Uh, the devil does have uh, some control over nature and those kinds of things. You remember when um, the different plagues were being uh, brought forth by God through Moses to, the, to Egypt in order to uh, deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, that uh, some of Pharaoh's uh, magicians were able to duplicate some of the miracles that uh, Moses was doing. So Moses took his rod and he, and he hit the waters of, of Egypt and the rivers and the streams and the everything, and they turned into blood. 
and Pharaoh's uh, magicians, they did the same thing. <laughs> Hello, you're only making things worse. <laughs> but anyway, they did it. And then they didn't learn their lesson there. God takes and, and you know, fills the land with frogs. And, and these aren't just kind of random things that God says, all right, I'll fill the land with frogs. They worship frogs. So, so he says, you want frogs? You want to worship frogs? I'll give you frogs. Until they're in your kneading bowls, they're in your bed, until you're sick of frogs. So the frogs, and so Moses does that. The frogs come forth. The magicians come forward. They do the same thing, and they bring even more frogs. So, but, they're, but just to say that they're not wise in their use of, of the power, but, but, but they, did, they did have it. Job is a classic example, too. The early chapter, too, where Satan has allowed some room to come against Job and all, and, and Satan does everything that he has the room to do it. He even brings a great wind that causes the house to collapse upon the gathered children of of Job's family. So he has some power over nature. So maybe he does produce some kind of a literal flood. I'm inclined to believe that the flood speaks of an army. It's symbolic language for an army. And uh, because uh, uh, it, it, the um, because I want to. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so it's a little better than that. Uh, in Psalm 124, the, the, uh, one of the imagery that's used there is of a great uh, Gentile army uh, coming, probably a Gentile army, but an army of some kind coming against Israel as uh, a flood. And so whatever this flood is, there's an attempt to destroy uh, Israel. But again, God supernaturally uh, protects her. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood by which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So somehow some earthquake or some kind of a deal, God opens up the earth, all of the water or the army goes down into the earth. Again, not unprecedented in the history of the nation of Israel. Remember when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and uh, a man by the name of Korah got a little upset with Moses' leadership. Moses, you know, you're the head of this whole thing and then your brother's the high priest and you got Miriam over here and it looks like this looks like nepotism. And, and here you've got all the power and everything and we're as smart as you are and we're as great as you are and everything. And, and so he leads a rebellion against the authority of Moses. Now here's the problem. The problem is God called Moses to lead the children of Israel. God called uh, Aaron to be the high priest. They were in the positions that they had, not because they had elevated themselves to these positions, but because God had called them to those positions and God was happy with it. And, and so he leads this huge revolt against Moses and against his authority. And Moses stays pretty calm on the whole thing and says, all right, well, I'll tell you what, on such and such a date, why don't you and all of the people that don't like what's going on here and you want to be a big rebel and everything and, and come out and, and meet. And then Aaron and I will, will stand on the other side and we'll let God kind of decide who, who he likes in this whole thing. So they all come out, this huge group of, of people in the rebellion against Moses' authority and Aaron's authority, and they all line up right over on one side of the camp and then there's Moses and, and Aaron standing on, on the other side of the camp and then Moses then proclaims to all of the children of Israel that are gathered around it's an interesting speech he said if these men speaking of the rebels die naturally like all men or if they're visited by the common fate of all men then the Lord has not sent me but if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you'll understand that these men have rejected the Lord. So he says, all right, and that's the speech that he gives. So kind of weird, all right, but if, this, if they live to three score and ten and they die, then, then they're right. But if a big earth opens up and they're swallowed up, then, then uh, I'm, I'm right on those. And it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them, the earth opened its mouth, swallowed them up with their households, and all the men with Korah and all their goods, whoosh, whoosh, gone. So he had end a rebellion on, on God's sake. So they brought a division. God knows how to bring a greater division to end the first division on, on things. So in 
in the history of the nation of Israel to be divinely protected in this way. Again, not, not un, unprecedented. This just makes the devil even more angry and all. Verse 17, so the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went uh, to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony uh, of Jesus Christ. So he leaves off his attack against them and he goes against any Jewish believer in Jesus that he can find. And so we'll stop there um, tonight and pick it up in chapter 13, Lord willing.